It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Mines. Welcome. My name is Abu Kaobuchi, and thanks a lot for joining us. Not a very happy time in the country. Uh, we did wake up a few days ago to news about a plane crash, which uh, uh, a number of uh, prominent members of our Nigerian military were uh, involved in, including the chief of army staff, and um, all lives were lost, unfortunately, and we're extending our condolences to all the army members of those involved in that uh, fatal uh, air crash. A lot of people have wondered how the sequence of events have continued to happen. We've had one too many military plane crashes and it's raising a lot of questions that people are worried. And um, this uh, hopefully will be the last. And we just hope that whatever it is, uh, if it's an investigation, then it's to happen to hopefully uncover and stop this series of deaths which are completely unwanted and unwarranted. Uh, we hope that we do get some news to that. We're going to be talking about uh, citizens' rights today and their right to protest. A lot has happened. In the last couple of months, we did see the end house protests at the end of last year, which threw up a lot of questions as well as, as to the rights of Nigerians to protest. And Kaduna State has been in the news recently, and we're going to be talking about you know all of that happening in that space. I'm joined here now by Timi Olagunju, uh, who's a lawyer. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, <laughs> Leonard Mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks for being here. Like I said, uh, protests have always been a fundamental part of, of human uh, existence, especially in democracies. And uh, even in Nigeria, under the military, we did see that happen quite often. Mm -hmm. And many people would argue that we only got our democracy eventually because of the series of protests and just people exercising their rights uh, to speak up. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like that's starting to look a little different. Correct me if I'm wrong, we did hear uh, from the Kaduna State Governor, uh, Malam Nasir El Rufai, saying uh, that leaders of the labor, uh, organized labor, were wanted. You know, s stories like that got people very confused. What exactly did you see happening there? What are your thoughts on that? Hmm. What did I see happen? Hmm. That's quite an interesting question, yeah. considering the fact that uh, evidence is the end of argument. Um, it was by the evidence of what happened, um, the situation could have been better managed. Um, particularly from the government side in context of the fact that, you know, by virtue of um, Section 20, they're about of, uh, you know, Labor Act, uh, for such kinds of um, actions to be taken by the government, whether federal or state, uh, there's a need to actually do some level of consultation um, with Labor, you know, and stating the rationale and then coming to the table of conversation to enrich the understanding on a better approach to carry out such action. And allegedly, uh, Labour says that none of that had happened. And so um, it seems more like uh, a top-bottom approach rather than a bottom-top approach. Yeah. You know, because the, the road to hell can be littered with a lot of good intentions. You know, um, It might be a good intention, but the approach is also very important. Yeah. I mean, the Gardner's government's argument is about reforming the civil service, uh, which every Nigerian has complained about. In <laughs> everybody, you always hear the talk about, you know, no matter how great a president we have, as long as the civil service remains the way it is, this country might not necessarily get to where it is. So is that a wrong thing for him to do? You know, that's why I mentioned that the road to hell can be littered with a lot of good intentions, you know. So it's very important that um, as much as the end might have a good state in mind, um, the approach to that end must also be legal. You cannot achieve an end of legality with a process of illegality. It's not possible. So uh, what, what is illegal now in, in the context of what you Yes, said? so con considering the provisions of the Labor Act and the Trade Unions Act, firstly is that Section 20 um, provides for a need for some level of consultation you know, and the rationale behind that is to create room for the government, whether state or federal government, to explain its situation, you know, to the labor union, then state the rationale behind its action, and then there can there be a meeting point to say, okay, you want to achieve this, how about we go about it this way? It is a democracy, and it has to be a two-way street. But when one person decides that this is the way I want to hand it down, then the approach becomes a little bit undemocratic, authoritarian. And as such, you get the kind of ripple effects that you get as a consequence of labor coming out to protest. 
within their constitutional rights. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is that Labour's work? Because a lot of people hear the NLC and just think protesting. Is that their job? Uh, are they supposed to protest? Is it also possible that there were other avenues could have been explored, like you said? Fantastic. And I guess my question is, do they share any blame in letting things de degenerate to where it got to at this point? Hmm. Whether they share blame or not is a very difficult question to answer. Because if you look at it, you know, like I like to say, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the makeup artist do? than put powder, right? So we've had successive governments where, you know, there has been a failed system leading onto this. And so perhaps Labour too inherits part of that mess of a consistently failed system, you know, um, in that context. However, the core context here is the fact that um, when it comes to governance, right, the executive is seen from a level of what we call in local parenti in some sense, which is that you are supposed to act in such a way as to create room for conversation and dialogue, irrespective of what the other parties are trying to do. That is governance in itself. And so conversation in that context, whether labor was, you know, reacting in its customary approach you know, of protesting, considering the fact that you must also remember that Labour inherited a militarized, a militarized system. During the times of the military regime, you see that there was a lot of protests. That's the culture. And so when you are approaching that kind of, you know, culture in governance, it's very important to always play your cards in such a way that you create room for conversation. I see no blame in labor what they have actually done because the truth about it is that there's a laid down procedure. It is like when, you know, a, you, you sign a contract, right? And that contract says ABC must be done before you go to courts. And you now decide that you're not going to do ABC, but you go to courts. That's what we call condition precedents. The government has failed to meet the condition precedent of dialogue and conversation as provided under law, hence, you have a reactionary approach from labor. So you can't blame labor in that context. Talk about yeah. social media now. Yes. And you know, this hashtag culture, because even the NLC, which most people have seen as quote unquote old school in their approach to protesting, came out and said, oh, please support us with this hashtag. And Nigerians were like, oh, this is your battle. That's a whole other conversation. But what, what sort of role does social media play in all of this? Because the, the, the governor of uh, Kaduna State actually tweeted about the NLC chairman being wanted. It was a social media message, basically saying, anybody who sees this guy, there's a handsome reward and all of that. Um, does this help or does this complicate issues, you think, social media? Uh, well, social media is only a tool. You cannot blame the tool. Uh, you can then blame those, the users of the tool. And in this context, um, it is quite clear that the governor erred in, you know, the process of governance, you know, which is basically, firstly, heard in the context of not following the procedure for getting labor on board. And then people make mistakes admit the mistake, and then call for dialogue because conversation enriches the understanding. Look, labor's right to protest is constitutionally guaranteed. Section 38, 39, 40, and 41 of the Constitution. In that context, and even by virtue of the Trade Unions Act and labor laws, so they have all gamuts of laws to back up the action. But for the governor, the governor has heard in terms of procedure. And so it was important to have created a room for conversation in that context. Yeah. Uh, Judy, uh, can you hear me now? You're supposed to join us. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I was asking about drawing any parallel, parallels, if at all, you know, with, with what's happened in Kaduna and what happened across the country in October with regards to approach from protesters and approach from government, and you know, how, of course, that tragically ended, and what's unfolding now in Kaduna. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it was, it was definitely going to happen. One can draw a straight line from what happened in October, um, especially October 20th, to future protests. 
and this is like the first what happened in Kaduna is like the first major protest since October, and um, it is it is now it is now proof that this government is very very anti people, anti democracy, anti people's rights to gather and protest and demonstrate, however it is they please. Um, so what happened in Kaduna is a test is a testament to what is going to happen in the future if the government continues on church. Um, I mean, labor has a right to protest, like um, T has said. Um, people, citizens have the right to protest, but the government, this government, is very anti-protest. And my worry is that they've set a precedent for future administrations. They've set a very very bad precedent for future administrations because what is stopping the next government from saying? People are not going to protest. We're going to calm down on them. What's really stopping them? After all, they have to proof of concept. You know, so it's yeah. there's a straight line between what happened in October and what is current, what happened in Kaduna, and it's unfortunate. The, does the state governor have any justification at all, you know, considering the fact that Kaduna has become a serious hotbed for insecurity? We've seen kidnappings very rampant there, a protest whether we like it or not, could go anywhere. We've seen it even in advanced countries where protests turn into something else. And um, could that be a valid reason to say, okay, maybe this is not the right time for us to let people loose on the streets without sort of control? Also, there's a pandemic, whether we like it or not, that's still raging. Uh, do those factor in at all in maybe what the governor's thought process was, was here? If, 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 that is the, if that is the governor's reason for clamping on the it's rather unfortunate. Protests are going to happen in every democracy. Even if you're doing well, some people are still going to have issues, and it is their fundamental right to protest. As citizens of the state, and as governor, and as chief security officer of the state, it is a responsibility to make sure that those who are protesting are protected. It is very, very, very important that you do that. There are state security forces. There are, there are, um, there are um, security units that are charged with doing all this. If you need support from the federal government, to get support from the federal government to make sure that protests do not go out of hand, that protesters are protected. Any citizen or anybody who's using their protests as an excuse to carry out their various activities, you can clamp on them different. Protest, protesters, people who are actually protesting for a genuine cause, they, have, they, are, they are easily identifiable from talks and talks and misfits. If the pandemic is an excuse, we know that so many things are happening in this country and nobody is, nobody is regarding the pandemic or anything. I mean, recently, people were made to go and register for the NIN and stuff, despite the fact that there's a pandemic. Only recently, people wanted to write them had to go register for, for their NIN again in a pandemic. So if, if, if the pandemic is going to be an excuse, I, I will not buy that. The governor, the governor said that the air, the field completely it is very disgraceful. Um, what, what, what is the role? Because you talk there about protecting uh, the citizens' right to protest. What is the role of security agencies in times like this? And I ask that because, you know, we've seen, we saw it in October, with, not just in Lagos, across the country. We've also seen it in Kaduna where protests start off r relatively peacefully and then, you know, we start seeing an infiltration. You know, there's alleged uh, talks about, you know, whoever sent them, we, we really can't verify all of that. But this seems to happen where peaceful protests now become sort of violent and there's hijackings and, you know, looting and all of that. Where does the police or the security officials' rights to protect protesters go from that to now saying, okay, this has become some, something else and, you know, we don't know who to protect anymore, how to sort of defend this situation, considering how things sort of flip here very quickly? Okay, so I'll use, I'll use the Lagos protest as an example, yeah? yeah. The protest I was part of. We had a section that we basically, you know, okay, I'll use Alaosa as an example. We had, a, we had our position. We were very easily identified, right? Anybody who wasn't part of our protest, we raised alarm, right? The policemen were there. They were basically there to make sure that um, law and order was maintained. And to also, maybe they were there to protect us as well, right? So, yeah, like I said, we're easily identifiable. It is the responsibility of security agencies to find out if particular protests have leadership or people they can point to and say okay so this these are the organizers or this is who we can talk to about anything maybe these people can talk to the crowd on our behalf right yeah. these guys are trained it is their job they are trained to do it so if they find out that people are beginning to infiltrate right they, they, there's a way i mean if, if i'm protesting peacefully and somebody wants to infiltrate i would not support the infiltrators I'll even call the attention of the security agencies to say, ah, we don't know these guys. 
it happened a few times, right? With these citizens arrest a few times, people get to protest ground and they run. With these citizens arrest, I've handed them over to the police, right? So people who are peacefully protesting, there's a way and manner they behave. People who are coming to infiltrate, there's a way and manner they behave. If you cannot distinguish between the two of them, you will have no business being a policeman. Resign. Quick question to both of you. First, first with you, Chidi. Um, just this talk about peaceful protesting. I mean, we saw banners uh, being carried during the NLC protests in Kaduna. We don't know who they were, but they were basically calling the governor names. You know, they were direct, for want of a better word, insults at the governor. Do those things cross the line? You know, where do you draw the line between saying, okay, we want to pass our message, or uh, where does that stop and then the insults sort of directly start? And does that still constitute peace? in the context of protesting so me personally i don't i don't do i don't do um ad hominem right i personally don't do that i i tackle issues directly i don't call them i don't i try not to do that i mean every now and then i sleep i try not to do that so i would not encourage people to you know attack people's persons but here's the thing there's mad insecurity people are getting kidnapped. now people cannot go to from point to point, you know, without feeling unsafe. Is it the names that are calling you that are that is more painful than the lives that are being lost? As as a public figure, you've opened as a public figure who's being paid from the common cause, who sought elections and got into a position or whatever. You have you have seen you have opened yourself up to any names and anything. If you perform well, if you perform well, if people insult you, people are going to defend you more than the people who are insulting you. If you do not perform well, you deserve every insult. So while I personally would not insult a governor or anybody, I would not call him names, I would not carry a that, you know, casting aspersions and stuff. I would rather tackle issues. I do not blame the people who are doing that because they've had enough. They are fed up. People are dying and somebody is mad about being called stupid. To, to me, what do, you, what do you think of that? Well, well, well uh, Ch Chidi has uh, rightly put the thing in perspective, um, which is the fact that, uh, you know, as much as it, the protest should be focused on issues, um, there is something called the freedom of expression. Um, as long as it does not rise to the level of defamation, you know, or libel of any sorts. And the truth about it is this. From the NSAS protest to the current protest that, you know, the NLC is having in Kaduna State, the simple truth about it is, if you look at the ranking, Nigeria ranks 14 out of 177 countries, fragile states. Fragile state means states in the verge of self-destruction or damage. Nigeria ranks 15 in terms of failed states or nations in the world out of 178. And so these issues of people calling names and the likes and protests are only just fruits of the roots that Nigeria is fragile and has failed its people. And so the call to government really should be focus on the major so that you do not become a major, in your, a minor in your major. Because the major is governance, not trying to clamp down on the people that are showing you where the issues are as such. Do you agree with him about the future being bleak with regards to precedents set for those coming oh, in next oh, oh, yes, it is. Interestingly, if you take the flip road, even um, the governor of Kaduna State had called a previous president names. There are videos everywhere on social media showing that. And look, the current president of Nigeria himself benefited from a court judgment. Remember the case of ANPP versus IGP, 2007, when the Court of Appeals said, yes, the NPP could protest. And the NPP was the president's party at that time. So the president himself has benefited from Section 38, Section 39, Section 40, and Section 41 of the Constitution, and should then definitely allow the Nigerian people also benefit from same. Thank you very much, Timmy, and thank you very much, Chidi, for joining us. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break now and be right back. Please don't go away. If you're Nigerian, I'm sure you know that our debt profile has risen considerably in the last six years. And we woke up to news a couple of days ago talking about Mr. President, uh, President Muhammad Buhari, writing a letter to both chambers of the National Assembly requesting uh, permission to borrow another, I think, $6.1 billion it was um, from uh, multilateral organizations.
um, to fund the deficit of the 2021 budget, and it got people worrying again. Uh, we're doing a lot more borrowing than we should be, or are we doing maybe just enough? I'm joined now by Mukhtar Mohammed. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure, Ibuka. Should we be worried? <laughs> no. Why not? We, we, we shouldn't be worried ordinarily. That's I mean. Ordinarily, um, debt is good for any economy. It's just like a businessman. You want to expand your business, you need to do a lot of borrowing to do expansion. Nobody does uh, expansion or build with just your own resources alone. You tend to borrow now. The challenge we have as Nigerians is we know the government is not telling us the, the, the real fact because borrowing in itself is not bad, but our debt to revenue is a problem. So that's their ability to pay back at that's when due. That is the major challenge that we are having here. It's not because we are borrowing. If you look at the government, when they came in um, initially, their, their borrowing plan is always tied to a specific project, and which is good compared to before that we just borrow. Then after we borrow, we can think of what to do with it. Now the borrowers are tied to specific project. Now this project have a way of having a, a bag wagon, a snowball effect into other sector of the economy, which is good. But now the worry we have is because if you look at our borrow to the GDP, our borrow and our GDP, that's not a problem. But when you look at our borrowing to debt, I mean debt to revenue, because our major source of revenue is oil. And once those, those oil revenue comes down, then we begin to have a challenge. And then you, do you just tend to use all your earnings in paying your debt? So people will wonder, why is the international organization, international donors, individual international corporations are still ready to borrow to Nigeria? It's because they know we have the ability to pay. But now that ability to pay will now have a negative effect on the, 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 the country, the, the country, the individual, I mean, the, the citizen of those countries, because that means a lot of projects will be tied to debt. So it takes a long time to be able to pay off those debts over time. But in terms of our debt to, to GDP, we are okay. Our major challenge is our debt to revenue, which we are most concerned about. So um, I think what a lot of people worry about is, you know, like you said, when you borrow, it's tied to a project. A lot of people are not clear about this particular amount now that we're trying to get out what it's supposed to be funding. You know, and we seem to always run, this deficit uh, seems to be very recurring now with, with Nigeria. And also, uh, does the pandemic have an effect on where things are now with regards to this new round of borrowing? Because the 21 budget has hardly been touched. We haven't seen a lot being done. A lot of Nigerians will say that. We we're barely in the second quarter, and we're talking about a deficit already, which is probably a good thing because you're projecting and you want to plan better. But... For the average Nigerian, this doesn't make a lot of sense, I yeah. guess is what I'm saying. You see, the challenge, like I said, with borrowing is that uh, it's more or less like an economic term. If you want to grow your economy, you borrow, you, you, you build from bottom to up. You don't go from up to down. So you, the bottom are the majority of the people that are at the bottom, especially in a, in, a, in a developing economy like us. But the challenge is that people are not seeing the effect of this borrowing in government because it's tied into a long-term project that people think is luxury. We're talking about rail project. We're talking about power project. We're talking about um, social intervention project, which doesn't really have effect immediately. It's in the short term, they don't tend to have effect. But in the long term, you begin to see those effects. When you see the railway comes into Spain, a lot of business are not springing up here because they're just People just put in rays on the line and um, say, oh, how does this benefit me? But in the long run, you're going to see a lot of business spring, spring up. And then it also is the ease of the farmers bringing their crops. So it's, 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 uh, it has a long-term effect. But now when you look at the current borrowing, like the debt management of, office came up to clear, it's not that it's a new borrowing. It's actually included in the budget. What, we, what they're trying to do is to, to get the National Assembly, you know, they have what we call the medium term plan. That, that borrowing is there. They're not telling the legislature to approve it now. Does the pandemic has a role in where we are today? Most people will be saying, no, it doesn't have because our economy was already struggling before the pandemic came in. So, we're, we're, yeah, we're struggling before the pandemic came in, but the pandemic worsened it. So, definitely has an effect. Why are all that donor and jet ready to borrow any developed nations? It's because of the pandemic. Because ordinarily, it would have been a Hercules task for Nigeria to get people to even want to borrow their money. Because they say, oh, look, you are doing well, the price of crude is okay, your benchmark is okay. Because currently, our benchmark is about $48, and we are doing about $60 to $65 per barrel, which makes it good. So, but when you look at the pandemic, there's a lot of things that have happened in the pandemic that are affecting people now. What the government's trying to do is trying to lift people out of poverty. But the way they go about it, that's one the challenge most people see. People want quick fix. But in economic terms, economic strategy doesn't just, uh, economic disaster doesn't just over, start overnight. It takes time. So, and then fixing it also will have to take time. So it, it's not that I'm saying that borrowing on itself is good. Because you want to borrow to credit, like credit. Now these days you see the bank are looking 
for how to governance the economy, we are giving credit to the private sector. It's the same thing with borrowing. When this credit comes in, but where are we really borrowing into? And but if you look at it now, I think we are borrowing to build infrastructure, especially in the power and transportation sector. You mentioned uh, you know the benchmark and you know oil and all of that, and it's of course it's great news at this time for Nigeria. But we know how volatile that sector is. You know how reliant we are on the on, on oil. This uh, benchmark you know, sort of surplus, for want of a better word, has only just happened in the last couple of months. We don't know what's going to happen in a few months. Is it, are you feeling confident? I guess my talk is about paying back. Because people are saying you're mortgaging the future of Nigerians. You know, you guys are not going to be here when this thing <laughs> blows up in our faces. Government we're lo government, we're, government we're, we're lucky, you know, or I guess strategic enough yeah. under President Abbasanjo when the minister uh, Ngozi Okonjo Iwala was able to negotiate, uh, you know, sort of debt relief and all of that at the time. We don't know if that's going to be able to happen again. Do you see something like that happening? Or Definitely. do you see us being able to repay this? Or even keep borrowing? If well, able to repay is, is a long... If you look at the, the, the tenures of these loans, they are already long-term tied to future generations. Yes. And they have to have more momentum, which means that for the next two years, the government is not expected to pay anything. Until then, the percentage, the interest on it, some of them is practically like 0 point something percent, some of them are 2 percent. That's why the government will tell that we are going to borrow outside. Because there are always two ways to borrow. You can borrow by the capital market, and you'll be borrowing at a rate of maybe 16 to 16 to 15 percent in terms of interest you are going to pay. Now, we are borrowing um, from, 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 from um, the, the abroad, I mean, foreign borrowing, and you are paying about 6 percent in some. And some you are even paying, like the, the ones from the donor agents, about 2 point something percent. To, one point something percent, then one two percent. So, which ordinarily is not supposed to be a challenge. Now, will we be able to repeat? Let's look at it this way: Are we trying to look inwardly to build in our economy? Now, strategically, we stem to be thinking we are looking inwardly because we are looking at the agricultural sector, we are looking at the petroleum sector. We are trying to expand that sector so that we begin to have local players. Then we begin to refine petroleum product. Once we get that right, then we are able to feed ourselves. The major challenge we have as a nation is in the area of feeding, the basic necessity that every Nigerian needs. Let me give you an example now. We don't import, fuel, we don't import uh, cement any longer because we have been able to take care of that. Even if you see in terms of uh, the price of cement keep going up, then that's where infrastructure comes in. So when we build our infrastructure, we are able to manage some of the in, in, in materials that we have here. Then we begin to see cost of building materials will come down generally. The same thing with food. Once we begin to consume what we, we, we begin to get, we consume what we have here, then we, we begin to think of how to export the surplus outside, then we earn more revenue. So the major challenge that we have as a nation in terms of repayment, because we are only looking at only one source of repayment, which is oil. So by the time we diversify into other sources, then we begin to see that we don't have a problem in terms of payment. It's like I normally say, it's like a man, if you have only one stream of income, you struggle. But if it's from your main stream of income that you begin to develop other streams of income. So now, what are we doing as, as a nation? We are looking at oil as our benchmark. We are using our resources in oil to try to develop other sectors. But we don't have the resources to develop these sectors through the oil. So we are trying to borrow using the oil sector as our repayment plan, which economically, it makes sense. But the challenge we have as a country is in terms of implementations of this policy, what these agreements are, are how are these agreements signed. Do, will we continue to have the Chinese managing these things? Are we trying to train Nigerians to take that for me? That's the major challenge, not in terms of the boring plan. And look at the boring, you look at public-private partnership. Look at the airport, the new international wind airport that the Chinese are building for, Chinese corporation are building for us. They're going to manage it for 25 years. After 25 years, they, they hand it over to us. So are we building our own men to manage it? Or after 25 yeah. years, we need to tell them again. The same thing with the rail sector. So same thing with the power sector. We need to begin to build manpower also to be able to take care of it. So that at that time, we reduce our dependence of paying these people foreign exchange. So that, again, we reduce the pressure on our own currency and build up our reserve in the, in the, in the long run. All right, some optimistic uh, end to that there. Hopefully things pan out like you hope. And uh, don't Nigerians, I mean, we can only hope for great things. Thank you. And exactly. thanks for being here today. My pleasure. We'll take a break now and switch some entertainment talk. Please stay with us. All right, if you heard the name uh, Deborah Oluwashi Joshua, I wonder if you would know who that was. But yes, my next guest, that's exactly her name. She's... Uh, uh, a singer, she's a vocalist, she's an, uh, sort of an icon in the industry. She's done very well for herself musically. And uh, you know her as Shea Shea. And she's my next guest on the show. Shea Shea, how are you doing? I'm 
I'm great, Ebuka. How are you? <laughs> very well, thank you. Good to see you, even though you're not here. I mean, I wish you were here for us to have a conversation. You're looking very nice today. You're getting ready for your live show, I believe. I am. I'm about to go live in in an hour or so. <laughs> How's that been? Because, I mean, Nigerian Idol took a bit of a hiatus for a while, came back with you now as one of the judges. First of all, what made you want to be a part of this show? And how has the experience been? Was it what you thought it would be? Uh, to be honest, I actually got the call. I didn't. I had no intentions of um, being a judge on a show. I had no intentions of being on any TV show. Actually, I got the call, and obviously, it was um, something I couldn't turn down. Um, uh, it has been incredible so far. We've been filming since February, and we are filming all the way till um july and uh, i've had a lot of fun i've had a lot of uh crucif crucif crucifixion people have been <laughs> getting me <laughs> yeah you know me. you know me i'm, yes, a, I'm a tough cookie <laughs> we've, been, we've been seeing some of that well you say you got the call and you never had intention so what what made you change your mind to say okay I, I, maybe i should do this what was it about the phone call or whatever it was that made you decide to do I, like I, I didn't change my mind. I, I had no, I was not expecting the call. So, you know, somebody just called one of the producers and was like, you know, um, hey, we want you to be uh, one of the judges on Idol. At the time, I didn't know who my co-judges were going to be. In fact, I didn't know who my co-judges were going to be until the um, orientation um, of the actual uh, first filming. And uh, so, but when I met, when I saw Sose and Obi, there i was relieved i was happy i mean they're my friends in the industry and and you know uh away from the industry too we're friends and so um i just i just didn't prepare for it i did not prepare for it at <laughs> all in fact it was such a shock to me but you can imagine how excited i was i was like oh my god this is like the biggest gig ever so yeah. and truly it has been it is the biggest gig and it has been incredible yeah uh, you, you talked earlier about, you know, the crucifixions. <laughs> I want to talk a bit about that. Because uh, literally the very first episode of the show, uh, you were mm. the conversation on everyone's lips. Um, did you see that coming? Did you see people's points, you know, with regards to, you know, how they interpreted, you know, probably your, your role on the show at the time? And probably still going on even. So I didn't think that... Uh, we as Nigerians were still not ready for the truth like that, like that. So you know me, I'm I'm quite I'm quite blunt. I keep it real all of the time. I don't beat behind, I don't beat around the bush. I mean, it, the first episode was such a shocker, but you know, at the end of the day, it's TV, right? And and it will always be made to look more elaborate than you know it was. And um, most of the contestants that came to audition for idol um were really good but there were a few here and there that were just really bad and i was there to judge i am here to judge i mean now we've gone into the live um episodes so it's now in nigeria's hands to call in and vote and text um so you guys decide now who gets to win the show and who gets through to the next round but earlier on in the recording of the of the show i it, the onus was on the three of us to you know kick people out or keep people in right and um, the people that were really bad were really bad. Like, I'm not going to lie. And I'm not going to say, oh, you know, you're great. And there were some people that were awful and, you know, were telling us that um, you maybe their friends or their families encouraged them to come and do this. And I was just wondering wh why. It's real. It's reality. This show is reality. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not scripted. It's not made up, you know. And so the, my, our reactions, my reactions are real. Um, and they, they're very honest. I, I just didn't realize that Nigerians were not as, we, we are not as ready to, to take the truth as um, I, I thought, I guess. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it, it just is what it is. I'm there to do a job. I'm getting paid to do a job. I'm a judge. I'm not a counsellor or a psychiatrist. I'm there to tell the truth. And so, so even now in this but, interview, you know me. Like, I'm always just keeping it real, right? Like, we got to just keep it real, especially in this country, yeah. right? I feel, I feel like too many people are um, just hooked on, you know, um smoke screens and mirrors and and lies and i mean social media obviously plays a big part in that but i think that maybe 
if we told more of the truth to each other, we probably would uh, make better decisions for our country and our economy, and we probably wouldn't vote for the kind of people we vote for to lead us as well, right? So I'm not going to get, get too political, but um, the the point is I'm a judge, and um, I think I'm doing well, a great job. So, so, so I, guess, I guess the point is most people would say saying the truth is one thing, and um, sort of being harsh is something else. Because I remember a particular one where he had told a contestant, you will never make it in the industry or something along those lines. And a lot of the opera no, was, why not... Ebuka, do you know what I really said? Or you just... Well, I'll get, I'll get to your response. Yeah, I'm just trying to paraphrase. But I guess my point is, people were okay with you saying no or saying you can't sing. But it, I guess it was the way you presented your comments and the kinds of things you said that got people you sort of up in arms. Do you agree with that? No. Did you watch that episode? Yes, but Yourself? I can't remember the exact words. Yeah, but I did watch it, yes. You watch the episode. So if you watch the episode, and for those of you that watched that episode, you would have um, you would have seen and heard if you wanted to, if you were really paying attention, um, that um, you know the young man came out and he said something along the lines of, you know, I, we said, why why are you here? You know, why do you want to be? So I said, I want to make money. So anybody that's passionate about music and the arts, and you, that wouldn't really sit right, right? First of all, because we don't do it for the money per se. We do it for the love. We do it because it's our dream. We do it because it's our passion. All right. So money is not really the first thing that comes to um, um, a real, I think, a real arts a muso or art artist mind. When they, and so when he said that, I was like, okay, great, you know, you sing. So he sang, and it was off, and uh, Obi and uh, so to say were like, yeah, no. Uh, and he was like, please, can I have one more chance? And I was like, okay, you know, okay, great, go ahead. And Sosie was like, no, hell no. And Obi was just like, you don't know. But nobody talked about the fact that I'm the only one that gave him a second chance, right? So anyway, he, he got a second chance, and then he sang, and it was still just not cutting it. Because we had heard so many other artists before him that were beasts you know in the in the good in the good sense right really good singers and it just wouldn't have been fair to put him through so um you know as a response to what him saying he wants to make money in this i was like look you're never going to make money in this industry however you are a fantastic songwriter because he sang an original song and i did say hey you're a great songwriter so hit me up after the show let's talk about the songwriting you'll make money songwriting but nobody's talking about the fact that i said all of that <laughs> you know, everybody's talking about the fact that i said you'll never make money in this industry <laughs> meanwhile that whole thing was filmed you know so um and it was aired on the on the reruns of idols yeah so, you know, but I think, um, like I said, you know, wh whoever, whoever kind of wants to take what they want to take from is always going to take what they what they want, and we we tend not to read uh, uh, the in between the lines, or even read the facts, yeah. or even research, or even think or listen. We just kind of jump on the ba bandwagon and on the train of right. uh, whatever is trending, you know. So, so that's what happened, and <laughs> and it's cool though, like. It's I mean, like, I know, you, like you said, you're a tough cookie and you can take it. So we're going to take a quick break. Yeah. When we'll come back, we'll talk more about you and maybe outside of the reality show. So don't go away. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. If you're just joining us, we've been having a chat with singer, uh, reality show judge, Shay Shay, uh, who's still with us. Um, Shay Shay, I want to talk about, you know, music now. Um, I mean, a lot of you artists... We're probably one of the few who were hit the most uh, during the pandemic with work. You know, concerts were off. It was just a time to just sort of stay away from, um, quote unquote, making money, <laughs> for want of a better term. Um, how has that been coming through 2020 into 2021? And then being, uh, being on a show like this, has that helped you sort of, um, sort of reset? Or is this sort of distracting you even from, you know, being more creative with, with your time with regards to music. How has all of that played out for you? Well, I mean, look, the pandemic was a disaster for everybody, the whole world. Yes, musicians probably got hit. Uh, we were probably one of the worst um, to get hit by the pandemic. Um, no shows, no concerts, no socializing, no, no, no nothing. A lot of people couldn't even go to studios, you know, where, you know, several people were. Thank God I um, have a set up in my house um, I even lost a huge deal at the beginning of uh, last year when the pandemic, uh, the, the lockdown w was announced. And um, it really sh it really knocked me down, like really badly, because I was thinking to myself, how long is this going to go on for? How are we going to make money? You know, all these things that normal people start thinking about when you realize you can't go out, you can't work, you can't do anything. So, um, but what I decided to do 
I don't know, something inside me was just like, you know what, this is really a time for you to now just like kind of go back to the drawing board, rediscover yourself, spend time praying, spend time like in, in meditation, spend time reading and like kind of probably just expand and broaden your, you know, your capabilities. Um, and so I started doing that. And one thing I'm grateful that I really that one thing I'm grateful for that happened, and as funny as it may sound, is that, you know, even though I lost this deal at the beginning of last year, I was able to go back into the recording studio and completely rewrite my whole album, all right? And and then I, by the end of the year, I had, I had uh, two albums, and one of which I'm ready to release in summer this year, called Big Girl. And so at the end of, by the end of the year, of course, I was like, just like under it. And I, and I was like, am I going to continue doing music at this point? Like what's really going to happen? Thank God I had saved money and I have some investments and things, you know, I was able to, you know, push through. Um, but when I got the call to do Idols, I was like, this is God. This is a result of my praying and my fasting and my meditating and my being disciplined and thank Thank you, Corona, right? And I know it sounds really bad, but uh, <laughs> I was like, thank you, Corona, because honestly, I don't know what would have happened if I didn't apply myself um, and just kind of focus on, you know, just like, a, you know, have a better, a better uh, 2021. Um, and, and, and the better 21, 2021 is here for me anyway. I have an album dropping. I have the idols. Um, which is a huge responsibility. And um, I also have a huge single right now called Pempe featuring Yemi Alade, which is what I thought we were going to be talking about. <laughs> but it's out now on all platforms. And it's two females, you know, in their prime, in the top of their industry, coming together, joining forces and putting out um, a message that basically talks about, you know, um, the setbacks that Pepe it as it were, or, you know, hot women. Yeah pretty women, fine women normally face in um, in the music industry, in any industry, but we're talking about particularly the music industry. How did that collaboration come about? And, um, you know, you mentioned album there. I got very excited. I mean, also, you said summer yes. is there a specific month. What's the album going to be called? When should we, when should we start looking forward to hearing it? <laughs> uh, so, to, so summer, this summer, July, we are, I am dropping a project, an album called Big Girl. Um, Pempe is not actually a song from the album. It is a song that was recorded um, last year during the whole pandemic uh, situation. Um, and um, I felt like Yemi Alade was the perfect person to feature on this record because of the context of the song. Uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, social media trolls. I'm talking about, uh, like I said to you, the the um, the di di division of women in, in yeah. industries. So I'm talking about, um, you know, um, uh, you know, just a number of things that affect women. And um, I'm just kind of voicing it and speaking out. And I felt like Emi Alade could relate. And when I asked her to do the song with me, she, I mean, she said yes. And obviously, if you listen to her verse on the song, <laughs> she just killed it. She hit the nail on the head, man. So we yeah. shot the video with Clarence Peters. And um, we channeled Missy Elliott and Janet Jackson, Son of a Gun video. And um, I think the message is very clear when you watch it. That's really brilliant. I mean, two females in the top. Do you, do you, are you, do you think that happens enough in the industry? Or do you think no, it should happen it. more? That's why we did it. It doesn't happen yeah. enough. That's why we did it. And it should happen more. And it will happen more, I think, as a result of, you know, this collaboration and, and other things that are in the and pipeline. be more intentional with it. Definitely be. I mean, the guys do it all the time. They come yeah. together, they're top of their game, you know, and they come together and they, they kill it. They make so much money together and they sell, you know, they just, and they become more popular um, and they gain more fans. And, you know, I feel like, I feel like the, the chicks need to kind of take a leaf out of that book, which is what we are doing now. Yeah. So we've talked about Yemi Alade, I'm oh, sorry, we've talked about um, Shay Shay, the reality show judge, uh, the singer. There's also the actor. What's happening to that? <laughs> well, did you enjoy Lara and the Beat? Yes, did of course. Did you ever watch it? Okay. Yes, I did. Don't, don't, yes, you watched it. <laughs> okay, so you know we had a watch. Yeah, so yeah that's had, all right. <laughs> it was a very 
there was a version of Lara and the Beat that ran for like three, three, three or four months in this in the cinema yes. in twenty eighteen. Yes. Is all over the country, right? And then uh, it went on um, South Africa Airways and a few other, and British Airways and Virgin and all these airlines, right? So it was one version. And then it started to win um, awards, um, you know, movie festivals, you know, just all over the globe. And then uh, last year, it got picked up by Netflix. By the time I watched it on Netflix, it was a completely different version of the movie. Well, not completely different, but it was like a better version of the movie. So for those of you that are um, that know Lara and the Beat, you've watched it maybe in the cinema. I would, you know, implore you to go and watch it on Netflix because it's such a it's such a better version. It's more it's more racy, um, and it's been edited for Netflix, but it's it just captures the story more. So I'm still acting. I just finished. Um, playing a role of Zara now in a new web series um, directed by Tola Odunsi and Osas. And um, it, that's coming out this summer too. And it's a very interesting, it's called um, Assistant Madams 2. <laughs> and then I have some other roles as well in the pipeline of movies coming out at the end of the year, but uh, I can't talk, I'm not at liberty to talk about those. So it's just, it's like 2021 is just a blessing for me. And um, 2020 set me up nicely for that. Yeah. That, that's good to hear. Yeah. I mean, triple threats indeed, man. You are, you, are, you are killing it on all fronts. <laughs> And congratulations on everything. I, I, looking forward to the album, looking forward to the series, and um, looking you. forward to the show the, tonight and, you know, the, the rest of the season. Get off that, get off that seat. Go, <laughs> out, go and watch Who's it. winning? Who's winning? Who do you think is winning? Uh, in my opinion, I think, I think Faith or Kingdom is going to win. So? Faith or Kingdom is going to um, win. Kingdom is very relatable, and he has an incredible... Um, he has he has an incredible um, dynamic, you know. He's so versatile. He can you can give him pop, Afrobeat, rock. I mean, he just murders it. And then Faith is like your classic uh, pop singer, right? Yeah. Sweet voice. He plays the guitar. He's incredible. Um, Beyonce is having a hard time. You know, a lot of people are giving her some some hard time, but she's just <laughs> sixteen, guys. Yeah, she's just sixteen. Okay, and uh, she has a long way to go. So whether she wins or not, she still has a future. And then my darling, comfort. You know, you guys. <laughs> you know, you guys have to. Vote. You guys have to vote yes. if you want to see somebody. You can't just say, ah, Kingdom should win, no, ah, <laughs> without voting. You have to vote. No, the All TV right. cannot, doesn't have or ears. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. We'll see if the viewers agree with you with your votes uh, when the finale comes around. Thank you very much for joining us, and have a great evening. Thank and you. a great year uh, ahead. Lovely. Yes. <laughs> well, like I always say, you can follow the conversation on Twitter. Robin Minds now is the handle. Please use the hashtag Robin Minds when you tweet at us. I'll see you next Sunday.